Hello everyone who is joining us. We are looking at some beautiful butterflies. Shelby says hi Nathan. So we're just gonna wait a couple minutes so our friends can join us and then when we get started It is 10.01, gonna turn my camera around here. We're gonna get started. I'm gonna set this up right here. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jenny, and I run the insect zoo at Iowa State University, and I'm also an entomologist. What is an entomologist? Well, my friends, an entomologist is a scientist who studies bugs. But as an entomologist, we don't only study bugs. We get to study the largest group of animals on Earth called arthropods. Now, what does it take to be an arthropod? An arthropod is an animal just like we are animals, but they're much different than we are. To be an arthropod, you must have an exoskeleton. Some of you already know what an exoskeleton is, but let's refresh our minds. So an exoskeleton is a skeleton on the outside of the body. Do you have an exoskeleton? No. Our bones are on the inside of our body, so we do not have an exoskeleton. So which animals have exoskeletons. Those are insects, spiders, tarantulas, millipedes, centipedes, scorpions, shrimp, crabs, and lobsters. So even some of the animals we like to eat, they are very closely related to insects. And if you watched our live on eating insects the other day, you would know that they're mostly made up of the same stuff. So it's just like eating shrimp, crabs, or lobster if you're eating crickets. And if you haven't tried crickets, you should try some crickets because they're really good. Now today, we are not going to eat bugs, but if you wanna watch that video, it's on our Facebook page, you can go see it. Instead, we are here at Ryman Gardens and we're gonna check out the butterfly wing and we're gonna learn about the butterflies that they have here and metamorphosis. So um, I have a friend here with me today that we're gonna meet. Nathan Brockman is an entomologist here at Ryman Gardens and he knows all about butterflies. So at the insect zoo, we don't have butterflies, but I did wear my beautiful butterfly shirt today just for you guys and for the butterflies because they're gonna appreciate it, right? So we're gonna first start by going over to the window over here where we can see all sorts of butterfly chrysalis and we're gonna talk about the life cycle of a butterfly. So let me turn this around. So here is the lab where they deal with all of the butterfly chrysalis that come in. So these come in from um, place from butterfly farms all over the world and they hatch out here in these chambers. So you can see up here we have some cocoons. Those are of a moth. Those are atlas moths. And then we also have chrysalis from butterflies too. So this is where they put them and then they hatch out. And look, there's one right there. But we might have some that we're gonna release today during the live. So butterflies start off as an egg and then out of that egg comes a caterpillar, which is also called a larva. And that larva or caterpillar, it eats and eats and eats on different types of plants. And it grows really, really, really big. 
and it molts or sheds that exoskeleton while it's growing. And then it's going to turn into a pupa and build a chrysalis or a cocoon. Here's a cocoon right here. And here's a chrysalis right here. And inside of there, what it, that cocoon or chrysalis, it's like a bug sleeping bag. See, here's some that are already empty. So it's like a bug sleeping bag. It's keeping that insect protected and warm and dry inside of there, but it's not really sleeping, is it? It is not. It is changing or metamorphosizing into an adult or butterfly or a moth. Let's go back over here and check out these ones again. So that, my friends, is called a complete metamorphosis or a complete change. So metamorphosis means big change. So these animals go through a completely big change as they grow. And when they pop out of those, the chrysalis or the cocoon, you can see, look, here's one that's empty right there. And this one, you can see it forming inside. You can see the darkness of, I can start to see the, the wings being formed. It's pretty cool. All right. Okay, you guys ready to meet my friend Nathan? Look, there's Nathan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nathan. Nathan. We have a double door vestibule, like most insect labs, so that nobody can escape. And I've got in this box here some new butterflies that emerged out of their pupa this morning that we're going to release today. Tad says hi, Nathan. Tad says hi, Nathan. Tad, email me. Nathan said, Tad, email me. bit of stuff that left over that understand. came from I our broker um, out of Colorado. Here's actually a brand new blue morpho. And so the blue morphos are a real crowd pleaser. On the inside, when they open up, they have these iridescent scales on their wings. So as I rotate this here, if the light shines off it just right, it'll change color. So the scale that is on their wings is structural in nature. So our butterflies basically have scales on a membranous wing that are overlapping, kind of like shingles on a roof or scales on a fish. Most of them are pigmented, so the color can fade. So like your shirt material um, would be a pigmented color, and over time it would fade. 
But the blue morphos, their scales are structural in nature, so light refracts off of them at different angles, therefore causing them to change colors. Uh, so they can go from a light navy blue all the way to a deep purple in color. So that's our blue morpho, so we'll just let that one go. Um, actually, so a good example of somebody who doesn't have a lot of scales, this is one of our large glass wings here, and you will see it doesn't have scales, wings. So it's actually a really amazing form of camouflage, having no scales, so that you can, for the most part, blend in with your surrounding around you. So when I release the butterflies in here, I always like to put them onto a flower, that way if they're one of our butterflies that likes nectar, they can nectar right away. So this one here, for just a brief second, extended its proboscis. So you can think of its mouth part, which we call a proboscis, as two hydraulic hoses with a gap in the middle. And they actually feed through the gap in the middle of the two hydraulic hoses, but the hydraulic hose aspect allows it to extend and for them to control it so they can probe into flowers. Put down this one right there. All right. So those are our new individuals. When we release them, a lot of times they need just a little bit of time to acclimate themselves to their surroundings. So these individuals will sit here for maybe 30 minutes, an hour max usually, and then they're off and flying and they've joined the rest of the butterflies that are zipping around in the space. So if we pop up, hopefully we'll have a moment here when uh, some of the blue morphos will come zipping by us and we can see them. They like to chase each other around a little bit. So we'll see, we've got a blue morpho sitting right there on the waterfall rock ledge there with its wings open. Many of photographers would be uh, jealous of uh, being able to get that shot right now because typically when a blue morpho is at rest, they close their wings because they don't want to show off their bright blue colors. Um, that's a tasty butterfly. If a bird or something were to see it, um, they would uh, be happy to eat it. And so when they're at rest, they tend to rest with their wings closed. And there it's closed its wings, and we can see on the outside that it's browns and tans. And so when it's sitting on a tree, it'll blend in with its surroundings, so taking advantage of its camouflage. So there are different ways butterflies protect themselves. Some use camouflage, some use warning colors. So our postmen, or our crimson patch, our long wing butterflies, uh, butterflies in the genus Heliconius, they have these bright yellows and reds. So these individuals flying right here, or our zebra long wing over there, or our Arminius long wing right here. Those individuals have bright reds and yellows and oranges that are telling things I'm distasteful, you don't want to eat me. Sometimes people like to say, well, they're a poisonous butterfly. I don't like to use poisonous because when people hear poisonous, they think, oh, if you eat it, you'll die. Well, a lot of things that eat them don't die, but they get sick and they learn, you know what, I don't want to do it again. And for a bird or a mammal of some kind, a small mammal, to learn that, they, they don't get taught it in school. Uh, they have to try one. And so typically they will try one bright colored butterfly, learn their lesson. Uh, there's a really famous picture online of a bird that just ate, uh, I believe it was a monarch. And then you can watch in the, the kind of the photo collage as the monarch is thrown back up by the bird. Um, because they are, they're, they're another individual that is distasteful to predators and make them sick if they try and eat them. So we feed our butterflies a variety of different ways. We have nectar plants. This is a porterweed here. You can see the little purple flowers. This is a great flower for us here in Iowa because it does really well at low light levels. So during the winter months, it will continue to flower um, all the time. Now it's gotten a little bit of a haircut right now, but, but does quite well. Our lantanas and pentas are another great nectar source. And if you zoom in here, we can see there is a postman feeding right there. 
Now, the postman is a difficult butterfly to identify because they have over 150 different ways they can look. So uh, over 150 different morphs or different forms of that same butterfly. And what makes it even harder is it mimics another butterfly called the crimson patch, which also has over 150 different forms as well. And sometimes the Heliconius um, do silly things like crossbreed, and then you get funny hybrids uh, even more so, making it even harder to identify them. I did see we've got a couple of malachites, which are a Central American U.S. species that would come over here just kind of hanging out on our waterfall plants. And they've got a green camouflage. So one's actually putting on a nice little show for us right now, flapping its wings a little bit there for us as we disturbed it coming close to it. See, they're both prepping themselves in case they get uh, to the point where they need to fly away. So as we got closer, they warmed up those wings a little bit. It's hard to go from a cold start to an immediate flight. And so kind of prepping, flapping the wings just a little bit, gets them ready in case we got a little bit closer and tried to uh, eat them, which we're not going to do today. No chocolate covered butterfly, Shelby. <laughs> so we also have some butterflies that don't like um, nectar. In the wild, they would never uh, nectar from a flower instead. They like things like dung, urine, carrion, rotting fruit, tree sap. Those first three I mentioned are smelly and not much fun to work with, so we tend to go with more of the rotting fruits. Um, so there's one of our fruit dishes. The other one's actually being cleaned right now. We usually keep two or three in here for them uh, so that they can get to them and, and, and get those that nutrients they need. Uh, we also have in our butterfly wing a, another feeder that we make for them that we actually created here and you can find them in butterfly houses around the world now uh, we use a highly absorbent water uh, water absorbing polymer crystal and we infuse it with a honey water solution and then we put it in this manifold and the butterflies will actually sit on it and feed on the sugary solution that it has within it so is there little holes in that there are there are actually holes and slits the original prototype uh, only had slits and there wasn't enough holding places so the butterflies kept slipping down. So we added holes as well and so they have more places to hold on, but it's still small enough gaps that the crystals don't just rain out of the tubes. And we can make them different colors. Uh, I find that blue is the best color. And, and really with both of our artificial feeders, so we have I like to call this one the vertical feeder, and then we have our other ones we call the horizontal feeders, which essentially have, uh, this is just a kitchen scrubber sponge, uh, the plastic ones, we take them out and wash them on a regular basis. This has a sugary solution in it as well. We use three different mixes in here. We use a 5% honey solution is one of our mixes. That's actually my preferred, my favorite. Uh, we do use a table sugar solution, so just 5% table sugar in water with pollen added to it. So pollen that's been collected by um, beekeepers as the bees come in. They have this special sweet broom that can knock the pollen off their legs. And then we grind it up and add it to that sugary solution. And the other one is just uh, diluted lemon lime Gatorade. We have powdered uh, Gatorade mix. We dilute it uh, way down from what uh, we would drink it at. And we put that in here as well. I find they do the best on the honey solution. Um, they tend to like it a lot more. And, uh, and so we provide them lots of different feeding options in here so that they have plenty to eat. And all of our plants in here, except for the pile that are right by the door, flower at some time or another and produce nectar. Here to be green plants and look pretty, they are, have to also serve another purpose to meet the mission of this, this space. And so we have all these nectar plants that, that they produce nectar and that they can feed from. So I have a question. Yes. So let's say a homeowner or kids want to put out a dish of food for butterflies. What might they put out? So you can put out uh, a sugary solution like this in a dish. 
just keep in mind that you're gonna get way more bees, wasps, ants, flies, beetles than you will ever get butterflies. You actually probably won't get any butterflies. But in here, since most of the insects that are in here are butterflies, uh, we have some other insects that are in here that aren't butterflies, um, especially when it comes to the plant pest. Um, we don't have issues with those other things feeding from them. Uh, you can put fruit out. If you have a fruit tree, just going out and not picking up all the fruit allows that fruit to sit and spoil, and then you'll have some butterflies uh, here in, in Iowa or in the U.S. Uh, morning cloak would be a great example of somebody who would come to to your plants. And actually, morning cloaks are one of the first butterflies seen in the spring because they overwinter as adults, and so uh, sap from trees is one of the things they're going to be feeding on right now. And so there's another thing you can be looking for out in your yard that you might have some butterflies on. So maybe a better alternative is to plant some flowers that the butterflies might visit. Yep, so planting nectar plants. Now, both of these are our pentas and our lantana. These are tropical plants. Uh, this butterfly wing is a tropical environment and, and we have to plant accordingly because of that. And these tend to do better. Uh, there's a lot of different plants you could plant outside. If you go to the Ryman Garden website and then under the tabs um, collection and then insects, you will find my uh, pollinator garden, butterfly garden plant recommendations. And I have nectar plants on the list, but I also have all of Iowa, at least for Iowa, Ooh. I have all of the butterflies that are found in the state and their host plants. And so the host plant is the specific plant that the larva, the caterpillar, can feed on. And, and so I have that all on there and you can then pick some plants. So if you are gonna plant a pollinator garden, a butterfly garden, it is great to plant nectar plants, but you really also wanna make sure you're planting host plants. Because if you wanna have butterflies in your yard, you, someone has to have caterpillars somewhere. One of my favorite things to say is, if you like the Red Admiral, which the Red Admiral is a really cool butterfly. It's territorial, they do these territorial bouts at night, the males do. But one of their main food sources they use is nettles. Stinging nettle. And for most people, a plant like stinging nettle is a weed. They don't want them, they don't like them. But if you want Red Admirals flying around your yard, having some stinging nettle around somewhere is a good thing. So a weed is only a weed if you don't want it there. Otherwise, it's just another plant. And so it's okay to let some of those plants that are less desirable for some grow. Uh, you know, maybe don't put it in the front of your flower bed, put it in the back. Actually, all host plants probably do better if you put them within the bed um, than putting them on the edge. They tend to all get eaten and then you would just have sticks you would look at. So the Christina Ryman Butterfly Wing is a 2,500 square foot facility. We keep it about 80 degrees, 80% 80 humidity all year round. It's kind of hard to tell from inside, but if we were outside right now, this building is shaped like a giant butterfly. So this big silver metal column in the middle is actually the body of the butterfly. The wings are going out to the two high points. On each side are wings. And then way at the highest tip, there is the head of the butterfly with two antennas pointing out of the top. And so again, if you go on the, the website, there are pictures of the building from the outside and you can see the butterfly shape in the building. So it's fun to be, that's why we call this space the butterfly wing, um, because we are in a butterfly with two big wings on each side. So Nathan, we had a question. What is the difference between a chrysalis and a cocoon? So chrysalis and cocoon. So a cocoon is an outer silken coating spun around a pupa. So we use cocoon as a moth term. We use pupa as the live part that's within the cocoon. As it turns out, there are some butterflies that are around their chrysalis, which we also call a chrysalis a pupa. Around their chrysalis, they spin a loose silken coating, which you could call a cocoon. See, the fun thing with insects is you should never use the words always or never 
Because the only thing that is always or never is you will always be wrong and you will never be right. Uh, so, so really, in the greater scheme of things, there's not a huge difference. Um, because uh, somebody like the, um, who does it? Silver Spotted Skipper makes a loose cocoon. It's just not as tight as our silk moth, like our Cecropia, our Luna, our Polythemus, our Atlas moth, the one that you saw that Jenny showed you in the case. Um, again, inside of that, there's a pupa. And there are some moths that never, some moths that never make a cocoon. Instead, we call their pupa a naked pupa. And the fun thing is some of those individuals, what they do is they actually bury themselves in the ground. So some of our sphinx moths, they actually pupate and then they, gy they make their pupa gyrate down <laughs> into the ground like a corkscrew. And then in the springtime, they gyrate in the opposite direction, driving themselves up to the surface. And that's when they emerge out of their pupa. So cocoon is just an outer silken coating spun around a pupa. A butterfly chrysalis is also a pupa. Inside a moth cocoon, you have a pupa, or you have a naked pupa, which doesn't have a cocoon. Good answer. Clear as mud, right? Yes. And of course, confusing. Hey, do you see this one over here on the sidewalk? What kind is that? That is our blue clipper. Woo. So clippers are a butterfly that tend to rest with their wings open. Most of our butterflies, as a whole, like to sit with their wings closed. Clipper is one that you'll rarely see with its wings closed. They, at, when, they, when they're at rest, even at night, they sit with their wings open. So one of those old stories people would tell you is that the way you can tell a butterfly from a moth is butterflies rest with their wings closed, moths with, rest with their wing open. Remember when I said don't use always or never because you'll be wrong? There are plenty of butterflies that when they're at rest, sit with their wings open and not closed. Here we have a fun, uh, plant over here that's actually fruiting. It's got at least one solid fruit on it. <laughs> so this is our Brazilian grape tree. This is the fruit. This is the Brazilian grape. Now it's a little different than our grape. It actually though fruits right off of the bark. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. And so in Brazil they will eat these. Um, you don't eat the skin. You do eat the inside though, and it has, usually there's two seeds in here. And so if I pierce through the skin here, I can make the juices and the flesh fruit part come out. And it does taste like grape. Um, so the way I eat them, if I were to eat one of these, was I would pierce the skin, suck out the innards, spit out the two seeds, and throw away the outer flesh. That is so cool. They do make uh, wine out of these, and they do eat them. Now, we don't eat uh, stuff that we grow in the butterfly wing, but, but if you were to eat them, that's how you would, uh, you would do that. And we do, we harvest these off of this tree, and we uh, break them open, and we will feed them to the butterflies, though. That's so cool. And what's interesting, though, is when you don't harvest them, the fruits actually just dry up right on the tree. And so you can see some of them. Are? Yeah, they are almost uh, raisin-like. Again, these are not our grapes, the grapes that we eat from the grocery store. They, you, you don't eat them the same, they're, they're not the same, but they are called a grape. And they do taste just like a grape. That is so cool. There are so many morphos over here. Look at them all over the wall. Oh yeah, there's, uh, we, Let's see, how long ago to bed? Four weeks ago, we got a shipment with morphos in it, and it had 50 morphos. Wow. Yep. So and so on the Ryman Gardens YouTube page, the other day I brought in a video camera, I set it up over on the corner over there, and I recorded for six hours in here when the morphos were at their peak. And so if you go to the Ryman page, you can just pull up that video put it on your, you know, cast it onto your big screen TV and essentially have a window into the butterfly wing and just sit back and relax, watch the butterflies flying around, going through their day, listen to the waterfall splashing in the background, um, and imagine that you're sitting in here with the butterflies. 
And I will post that video on the Insect Zoo's Facebook page so that you guys have easy access to that. Here's a fun piece that we can actually see. So with all these butterflies in here, any plant pests we have, like mealybug, scale, aphid, we can't control those pests with, uh, and we can go over here and I can show you some. We've got yeah. some aphids. We can't control those pests with an insecticide, nor would we as a public garden really want to use an insecticide. And we try not to use insecticides as much as possible. So what we do to control those insect pests that would attack our plants is we use beneficial insects to do our work. And so to attack what insects are causing us some problems. And I'm going to pull this leaf off here. And bring it over here for Ginny. Oh, well, they're, they're all empty right now though. So those small little cream colored things you can see, yeah, you can see those there. Yeah. Those are mummies. Those were aphids that were feeding on our plants. So an aphid is, is a true bug. It actually is a bug. It has a piercing sucking mouth part. It inserts its mouth part into the plant. It sucks out the juices from the plant. And so we release a wasp in here that can essentially smell them. It will then come and the females will lay their eggs inside of the aphid. The aphid will keep going about its day, keep eating, but the egg will then hatch. The parasitic wasp immatures will start eating the aphid. The aphid's body will start to swell. And just like the movie Alien, when the alien erupts out of that one character, a new wasp will erupt out of the aphid. And then that wasp, a male or female, will mate. And then the new females will go around and sting more aphids and we'll get more mummies and the process will continue. So that same thing happens out in the wild. Uh, we just introduce the wasp in here to help us control our aphids. Just like we release a, a beetle called the Cryptolamus beetle. Looks a little bit like a ladybug. Uh, coloration's a bit different. Uh, but they'll go around and they'll eat our mealybugs. And what's even cooler is their immatures a mealybug is uh, kind of white and, and a little, uh, looks like it has like white duff or dandruff on it. The mealybug, um, the cryptolamus that eats the mealybug, they're immatures, which we would call a grub. Uh, they also look just like a mealybug. So they're kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing as they run around as immatures eating the mealybugs as well. So both the grub and the adult beetle feed on the mealybugs. Oh, we got some sun. So yeah. the sun has come out, which should help stir up some of our butterflies a little bit more in here. It's amazing just how much light levels affect the activity level of the butterflies. But if you think about it, you and I, when it's dark and gloomy and rain outside, we don't want to go out either. We don't want to be all that active. We just want to hang out. But those bright sunny days, we want to get up and get moving. And again, you can see the sun's come up and it might not come across on the video, but the butterflies have definitely picked up their activity level. I think we can see some of the butterflies flying around for sure. And you guys, it smells so good in here. That's one thing you can't get from the video is the amazing smell. And what did you say that smell was from, so Nathan? That's this plant right up here. This is the sweet almond. And it's got all these, it's these white flowers right here. Oh, those are beautiful. I hate to fall into the pond. It looks like it just basically. snowed on you. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. The, the, the ones that are finished flowering, they all fall off. They do make a little bit of a mess, but when they, yeah, they are really fragrant. As soon as people walk in, they're just kind of overwhelmed by the smell. That's the first thing I said when I walked yep. in. Hey, Nathan, what is that white butterfly on that leaf right there? Giant wood nymph. So here's a little fun thing, since there are a couple of other people from other exhibits. Uh, so Idea Lucanoia is the scientific name for that butterfly. 
each facility you might come to, Butterfly House around the U.S. and around the world, they probably use a different common name. So it gets called the paper kite, it gets called the tree nymph. Um, we call it, we use the common name giant wood nymph for that one. We call a different butterfly the paper kite, actually a relative of that. This is the blue wave. Oh, oh the blue wave. We were just watching it and coming to it and then it flew from us. That um, one was It also beautiful. has iridescent scales just like the blue morpho does. And actually a hard one to see right now, Jenny. I'm going to keep myself across the waterfall again here and not fall in. And if I don't make it move, I'm going to point my finger at one. Oh my goodness, I didn't even see that. Yep. So this, and, and, and hopefully while playing along at home can see it right now, this is one of our cracker butterflies. This is a gray cracker. Uh, cracker butterflies are really do interesting. Do you want to do a close-up of it? We're going to pass off the phone, folks. Not going to drop, drop Ginny's phone into the water. I have insurance. <laughs> Not going to drop it into the water. So there it is right there. Fun little bit about the cracker butterflies. And actually, I think that may be the variable cracker now that I looked at it up closer. Um, the cracker butterflies can actually make an audible sound that we can hear. So they make like this, the males in particular, uh, really the males for the most part, as they're flying, they can make this electrical ticking sound. So it kind of sounds like bleep, bleep, bleep. And, and they'll do it to... Wait a minute, do that one more time. Bleep, bleep, bleep. That's my interpretation of it. I can't click quite as hard as they can with my tongue. Um, but, but they, uh, yeah, it's a snap popping sound as they're flying around and you can hear it in here. And this is not a quiet space when the waterfall's going and the door fans are running. So why do they make that sound? It's part of their territorial kind of establishment behavior, um, part of their mating behavior. And, and there's another one that just landed right there on that pole over there. So it's a little oh, easier yeah. to pick out because it's not against a rock background. Actually, there's another one on the rock right behind it, too. There are three right there on the edge of that oh, boulder. Oh, yeah, and then there's one see... right there. Boy, Ooh, you're good at spotting. Owl. Can we go look at the owl? Yeah, let's look at so that. So we're going to go look at the owl butterfly. The owl butterfly, we fly a, a handful of different species. I, I think we've received eight different species, but we're permitted for... 12 different species of Caligos. Caligo is the genus for the owl butterflies. And here's one here. But the owl butterflies get their name because they have this eye spot that makes them look like an owl. And when they're threatened, they flash that eye spot at a potential predator that would eat them and hopefully scare them away. And when their wings are open, they look very much, and I'm actually gonna grab a different one so we can look at it, but it has a little more of its wing, so it looks a lot more like an owl. So when I open this, this butterfly will look a lot like an owl's face. Wow, isn't that so cool? Yeah. Now, they actually did a study looking at the eye spots and how they protected it. And they were, you know, kind of along the lines of how do butterflies know to make eyes to scare things? So what they did was they took some butterflies that have eye spots. They covered the round eye spots with different shapes, triangles, squares, rhombus, other shapes like that. And they found that when those butterflies flash any shape at a predator, it scared the predator. And the predator ran away. So why don't butterflies have diamonds to scare away predators? Well, when cells divide out, they divide out in circular patterns, not in star patterns. And so when we get our wings covered with scales, they're in circular patterns. That's why we don't have stars. What is this one right here? Its wings are moving so fast. That is a tailed jay. There's two of them now. Oh yes, they're friends. Graphium agamemnon. Those are beautiful. Could be friends. So again, in the butterfly wing, the butterflies go through all their normal behaviors. Uh, so some of the behaviors we could be exhibiting could be courtship behaviors, male and female. Uh, they can go through all the courtship dances. 
Um, they can even mate in here, but as part of our USDA regulations, we don't have any host plants in here, which should deter everybody in here from laying any eggs, because females only want to lay their eggs on host plants. Now, they can also be males defending territory, um, a group of males and females just flying around together because they're similar species. You'll find our butterflies chasing the blue morphos on a regular basis, um, either, in, either in part for the interest in their blue wings or sort of that small butterfly or small bird sort of behavior you see when they go after a bigger animal, a group of small birds going after a larger one to scare them out of their area just by sheer volume of individuals pestering them. There we go. We got that sunlight. We got some blue morphos flying around. We got some of our, our long wing species. Our tiger long wing, Isminius long wing, postman crimson patch. Numata. The All sun came out up. just in time, yep, didn't just it? Just in time before we run out of time. This is absolutely beautiful. We can't wait until we're able to come and visit Ryman Gardens again. And I saw some comments of people saying they've never been here. So if you live in Iowa, you have to come to Ryman Gardens. And if you don't live in Iowa, you should still come to yeah. Iowa and see Ryman Gardens. We Not only do we have a really fun butterfly house, but we are also home to Elwood, the world's largest concrete gnome. Yes, we have, all my kids have pictures next to him. Yeah. It's a must-see attraction. World's largest, my best friend Andy loves the world's largest. So when I moved here eight years ago, we came to Ryman Gardens to see the gnome. First thing, yeah. Yep. yep. Elwood, Elwood is popular. People cutting cross country from California to New York or vice versa. We'll have quite a few that stop on their way. Like, do you have a large gnome here we can see? It's yes. Yes, it is here. Come and see the gnome and the butterflies and the beautiful gardens. They have yep. so many beautiful plants here. And 17 acres of heavily planted. Right now, the tulip display we, is, is just starting to bloom. We have 60,000 bulbs that we planted last fall that are now starting to flower. I'm making a time-lapse video for everyone that can't come in and see them um, right now. Uh, yeah, so, and we theme ourselves each year, too. And so this year, if we do get to open up here eventually, um, we're gonna have a Lego show here. <gasps> so larger than life animals made of Legos. This year's uh, show that's coming is Nature Connect Five, and it's very zoo themed. So it'll have large um, zoo type animals, but also has um, butterfly in it and some other stuff as well. That sounds awesome. All right, my friends, I'm gonna turn my camera around here. And I'm going to say thank you so very much for joining us today. And let's say thank you to Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. This was Bye. wonderful. Now, um, before I go, I do want to mention that you need to wear sunscreen when you're outside. So I got sunburned yesterday. My son and I were outside watching the demo of the Insectary Building on Iowa State's campus for five hours. And I didn't put on sunscreen. We're doing it again today, and I'm putting on sunscreen. So make sure you wear sunscreen when you're outside on these beautiful days. And thank you so much for joining the Insect Zoo today at Ryman Gardens. And I hope to see you guys on Friday when we will read the book Una. We will follow this little cricket who has lost his song on his journey to find out why others sing and why he is different. So we're going to meet a lot of awesome friends during this story, and it'll be super duper fun. So my friends, thank you so much for joining us. Please go forth and love the bugs.